Good evening, my name is Glenn Renfro. I was a project manager on the Collin County Detention Facility, a project that I think made history, and a lot of that history is thanks to Terry Box. I had the opportunity to work with uh, three different sheriffs over the years, and I got to know Terry from a, a professional, personal, and a social basis. And from that basis, I'd like to inform everyone here to never, ever get into a poker game with him, never to play golf against him or fish with him for money. You've got to be that you'll lose every time. He's the luckiest person I've ever seen in my life. Just consider yourself forewarned. With Sheriff Box, history was made for Collin County. This, the existing jail was overcrowded. It was fraught with problems from a maintenance standpoint, operational standpoint, safety for the detention officers. It was just a bad situation. 1987, somewhere there about, the commissioner's court put together a bond committee. And rather than just, just try to talk to them about the problems that were going on with the jail, we decided to physically take them inside the jail, see the operation, see the behind the scenes things, and see what all the problems were. They came out with, with a new uh, idea that we really did need a new facility. That facility uh, ultimately was planned at, and given direction by the bond committee to us that we should come up with, with a facility that would last Collin County out into the future. Total price for that bond package was about $50 million which also included you know, the land and the construction and everything involved. It went before the voters, and the voters turned it down. Now what do we do? Well, it just so happens about that time that uh, there was a law change at the state level which said you can do a public finance corporation. In other words, using private funds to fund public uh, projects. So a facilities finance corporation was put together and also an architectural firm was selected. At this point though, I think that you need to understand that we had what's called an indirect supervision facility. Indirect supervision means that the inmates are on one side, sheriff staff is on the other side. And whoever controlled the inside was the cell boss that was usually the strongest, meanest person you could possibly find. And we had conversations with the architect about direct supervision facilities. Well, we didn't know what that was because we hadn't seen one in existence. But sure enough, uh, we decided to take uh, a tour of some jails across the United States that were indirect as well as direct supervision. We went to Boulder, Colorado, uh, which was a, a direct supervision facility. When we got in the facility, we heard uh, music being played. We walked into a gym that they had, and here was a pregnant lady, uh, probably about eight months long, leading jazzercise and exercise to the inmates. The sheriff asked the sheriff of Boulder County, he said, yeah, what's all this about? He said, well, what we've discovered is that if you treat people normally, we don't care what they did on the outside, but here in the jail, we care what they do specifically. You see that lady over there giving the jazzercise? She is protected by 10 inmates at all times. No one will ever, ever come across or hurt that woman. Fort Collins, Colorado was a direct supervision facility. Then we went to Ventura, California. All the time we had uh, several of the commissioners, the architectural firm, and certainly staff that Terry felt like was uh, or should be to this job. People like the chief deputy, the sheriff himself, uh, David Heisserode, Randy Clark, myself. And what we wanted to do was get completely immersed in what direct supervision facility would be. In Ventura County, what we found and it was an indirect supervision facility, which here again, the first time, thing that you do when you walk into a jail that's indirect, it smells awful. 
from sweat and other body things, and, and it's just it's just a, a bad environment. Inmates are on one side, staff is on the other side, and you have to fight your way in and fight your way out. It just wasn't a good thing. We wound up at Warshaw County in Reno, Nevada. This was the model for all direct supervision facilities in the United States. We got back and we talked everything over and, and we decided that one of the things that we need to do is take what we had learned on this tour and take share of staff, come up with all the ideas in one, one room. So we went into what's called a design charrette. And here we had planned to go off-site, be locked up for a week. Interesting things when you happen whenever you do something like that. At the design charrette, we plan to work from 8 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon. And hopefully, uh, after a week, we would have our design. People got excited. Everybody who was going to be involved in this new facility was at the design charrette. Whether it was medical, whether it was maintenance, whether it was a sheriff, the sheriff's staff. And lo and behold, you'd wake up in the middle of the night and walk into the conference room where we were doing all the planning, and there'd be somebody working two or three o'clock in the morning. This went on for four and a half days. At the end of four and a half days, we had our design. It was, re it was really pretty interesting because uh, we invited the commissioner's court to come up at noon on Friday. The architect got up and started explaining the design that we had. And all of a sudden, David Heisroth shoved the architect out of the way. He said, no, this, this is the way we do it. This is the way we want it. It was a complete buy-in uh, for direct supervision for our staff from every aspect and every angle. When you think about building a new facility, it's like manufacturing. You bring raw materials in at one end. You don't cross the services that you need in that facility and then you wind up with an end product. In this case, it was people being arrested. It was having laundry separate, having food service separate, having visitation separate, having staff where they were intermingled with the detention officers. What we found was that this was a truly a, a, a blessed way of, of making this facility work. The other thing I think that, that's really critical in, in making an operation and a facility like this happen is that Terry agreed to have what's called a transition staff. These were people that would be intimately involved in making the things happen once the construction was completed. I believe Randy Clark headed up that transition team, but we positioned them in an old house that was on this site. And we said, here's what you want, we want you to do. We want you to write standard operating procedures. We want you to test those operating procedures. And the way you tested them before the jail came out of the ground was we built a model. It was eight foot long, approximately five foot wide. And every aspect of this new jail was now on that model that they could test their theories and test the operations. The facility came out of the ground. It was a $34.7 million project that uh, was our cost estimate and our budget. It came in at $1.4 million below budget, ahead of schedule. The day we opened, every staff member was trained. They had their own operating procedures. They had their own book. It was amazing from, from start to finish. All of that, I think, made this direct supervision facility and, and Terry um, probably recognized as a leader in direct supervision within the United States. We now have a cell boss that's a detention officer. Justice is swift and sure. Pressure from the inmates keep things under control. We now have a detention officer in with at least 45 to 75 inmates at any one time. If somebody acts up, they were gone. They were gone to administrative segregation, locked down 23 out of 24. The other interesting thing is that sheriff, uh, the sheriff agreed that not only 
should we operate the facility as direct supervision, but took on the mantle of this facility being open to any other sheriff, any other court, or anybody interested in building a direct supervision facility. He invited them to come in and tour. I've seen him actually invite grade school kids and tour the facility because there would be no fear because it was under total control at all times. Other interesting thing is that when somebody wanted training, the sheriff uh, agreed to let them come in and train with our staff. That's a pretty big deal to have people that don't work for you come in and work in your facility. Then going above and beyond that, if the invitation was there, the sheriff would send people to other facilities to make sure that they were operating direct supervision the way the original philosophy was set out. The sheriff welcomes them to come and study, to look at our SOPs. The Collin County Detention Facility was originally designed for 1,150 inmates through the support core. Originally we opened with 560 some odd inmates. It has since added other clusters and continues to expand. We originally guesstimated and it's proven to be right that Collin County will build up to our final build out and somewhere around 1.5 million people. It's getting very close to that in the next few years. There will be another institution just like this one uh, on this piece of property. But I think what is important to me and to the crowd or to the people that are here is to understand that Terry and his staff did set and make history with this facility. I consider Terry a very special man, my friend, and the best sheriff I've ever had the opportunity and pleasure of knowing and working with.